Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to our final webinar in the series. Today, we will be looking at a case study on asset management maturity assessment for UK local road authorities. My name is Christian Roberts. I'm the National Practice Lead for WSP Asset Management in the United States. And with me today uh, is Matthew Lugg, who is our uh, in, he's a, who is an international expert, but he is uh, also leading our um, local government practice in the United Kingdom. Matthew, do you want to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, um, thanks, Chris, and uh, good day to everyone. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share some of the experiences that I've been having in the UK with asset management. My background is in local government. Uh, my current role is head of profession in, in WSP, uh, supporting all our local government commissions. And uh, I have a good pedigree in asset management being seconded into government as well. Thanks very much, Chris. Great, and it's great to have you here today, Matthew. Thank you. Um, if we move over to the agenda slide, please. Thank you. Um, so today, this is our final webinar and we will focus this presentation on maturity assessment and a case study for maturity assessment with local roads, um, providing both the context and the approach and the results and benefits from that um, project. Um, if you have questions, I encourage you to put them in the chat panel in the go to, go to webinar panel on your screens. But before we jump into that uh, case study, I, I did think it was worthwhile just providing a bit of an overview of WSP's asset management maturity um, approach and the work that we do in this space. We're a leading provider of asset management maturity and capability assessments, and we've been doing this for many, many, many years. Um, we support agencies with that initial assessment, and we, we support the improvement activities right the way through the delivery of an overall transformation program. Our approach is endorsed by the Institute of Asset Management. Um, we are uh, skilled in assessing both with the IEM's assessment toolkit, and Matthew's going to talk about that in a moment or two. Um, we also have our own assessment methodology, uh, a, a toolkit which we refer to as AM2C, which extends beyond the ISO requirements and extends beyond some of the, uh, the IEM's uh, toolkits and includes other business critical functions, including, for example, continuity of operations planning. And we've spoken about that in one of our earlier webinars. Typically, when we assess, we, we build out and deliver an improvement program. And then that program is, is moved into um, a, a, an organized way of delivering change within, within a client organization. Um, so with that, we deliver organization transformation. We help with organization design, um, roles and responsibilities, etc. We develop the management system side of it. So all of that process and procedure improvement. We focus on digital. So we look at technology, the acquisition and implementation, and we look at the data and information as well. And we can help agencies move through to full ISO compliance and whether they decide to then go through certification or not, we can assist with that too. Um, another reason why we do capability and maturity assessment is to help clients benchmark themselves with each other. And that is the purpose of today's um, webinar is to talk through a particular approach of how we've helped a group of local roads um, undertake a benchmarking exercise and define improvements in their own organizations by learning lessons from others. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Matthew, um, who's going to walk through this um, presentation. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, Chris. I thought I just want to provide a bit of context. So here's a map of England uh, with Wales and Scotland chopped off. Nothing, nothing to do with Brexit, but just to illustrate um, the local highway authorities in England. Um, and I guess as around the world, uh, local municipalities are generally responsible for managing local roads. So I do hope a lot of what I'm going to share with you this afternoon is tra transferable to you where wherever you are in the world. Interestingly, in England, there are 153 different local authorities that manage local roads, and that represents about 98% of the total road network. And just get a feeling for the sort of budgetary perspective on this, about 3.6 billion is spent annually on local roads, and that equates to about 120 pounds being delivered on the ground in terms of expenditure per kilometre. 
But in terms of uh, the issues facing local authorities, I think one of the interesting aspects is the variation in size between these local authorities. So um, we have very large uh, county councils that have large networks. So Devon, the large blob uh, it, on the bottom left of the map is where Devon sits, and they have a network of nearly 13,000 kilometers. And then at the other end of the spectrum, and this is outside of London boroughs who have an even smaller networks, we have Hartlepool Council in the northeast that only has 254 kilometers. And this is important in relation to issues around capability and capacity, uh, which need to be um, you know, considered in, in this perspective. So if we can move on and just think about some of the challenges, and again, I think uh, some of these will be universal wherever you are in the world, but I use this um, a picture from the Asphalt Industry Alliance survey that we have done annually in this country, just to illustrate the scale of the problem that we've been facing in the UK around the condition of our local roads. And this has uh, happened over a number of years. We've had 10 years of austerity, and just at the time we were hoping to come out of that, you know, there's a further worry in terms of having uh, you know, the issues around COVID and having to support the economy and how that's going to impact on the public sector. In, and that has, um, all the austerity resulted in up to 40% cuts in revenue that's had a, a direct impact on local highway authorities. In addition to that, um, we've seen the increasing impact of climate change as you will as around the world, particularly in the UK around road condition. So we've had a number of severe storm events, floods, plus very severe winter, winters, and all those play havoc to the condition of the road, sort of culminating in, in some of these um, pictures of the deterioration of the local road network. The slide shows some of the, the numbers, over 11 billion of backlog um, is needed to bring these roads up to standard, an annual shortfall of over 800 million. And the other issues we're having to face is the utility companies in the UK are allowed to put their services in the carriageway, and whenever they do that, they infect the integrity of that structure, and we have over 1.8 million of those openings to, to deal with. So I think you can get appreciation of some of the issues that local highway authorities are facing in, the, in, the, in England. And if we move on, there was some good news at the beginning of the year where recognizing the overall issue about the need for fiscal stimulus and investment in local roads, uh, local roads did get a 2.5 billion increase in the budget by government uh, in, in March. And that represented a significant increase of 50% of funding. So I think considering this issue and the condition issue, this seemed a really good time for us to talk to our client base and say, you know, you need to think about if there is more money coming in, how you effectively prioritize it, you know, against all the, the challenges you have. And the approach we uh, considered and offered to them was to undertake an asset management maturity assessment. And if we move on to the next slide, um, as Chris has mentioned already, uh, this was based on the Institute of Asset Management self-assessment approach, but we didn't necessarily follow that rigidly. And we looked at a two-part questionnaire, which I'll talk a bit more in detail in a moment, but also to recognize that actually only one highway authority in England has uh, accredited asset management. So although we're using uh, something that looks at all the asset management attributes in terms of the standard, um, many authorities or most authorities don't actually have that accreditation. And if we move on to the next slide, I'll talk a bit more then about the approach we took in terms of the survey. So as Chris mentioned, you know, part of this was to help look at benchmarking around a number of attributes uh, with individual authorities, things like roles and responsibilities, training, the key assets, the systems they have, condition, and the key challenges. And the second part was more specifically around that Institute of Asset Management self-assessment technique, looking around the, um, the seven attributes in this diagram, around the plan, do, check, act type uh, circular process. So in that context, we asked very specific questions, as I said, around training. And what we wanted to do was to try and look at uh, individual authorities' uh, capability based around the need to have competencies in asset management so we could help advise how they might improve them and, and just assess where they were in terms of some of the guidance that we have in the UK. We also uh, wanted to ask questions, next slide please, around key assets in terms of the data that they held. So these were the sort of assets, uh, that are key assets in terms of highway infrastructure. And we asked questions in relation to the inventory and condition of all those assets for all the authorities. 
and um, we managed to get engagement with 12 of our commissions to do this work. So we had a quite a good group of authorities to undertake this comparison, comparison work. Just moving on again in terms of the system. So recognizing obviously a key part of asset management is the asset systems where the information is held both in inventory and condition and what we wanted to look at across these different systems was whether there was benefit around scope for integration how they interacted with the customer interface and also uh, looking at the innovation around the digital agenda were were these systems um, really sort of fit for purpose in terms of maximizing um, the um, the ability to effectively gather data and if we could move on in terms of the detail around the asset management maturity assessment, um, the next slide, you'll see uh, the specific questions or the areas of questions that we had around the maturity assessment. And those were around those seven attributes I showed in the previous diagram. So this was very much a self-assessment process. And what each individual authority had to do is score themselves against these attributes in general, which were detailed in 29 specific questions. And they had to rate themselves as either innocent, aware, or competent in that context. So in terms of the information we got back, I'll just start sharing some of that with you. And the first one is around condition data. So having uh, gathered information around condition data, we were immediately able to start looking at benchmarking. And this, this particularly, these graphs look at carriageway condition, and in England, we have um, various hierarchies. So we have main roads, the next level down B and C roads, and the unclassified roads. And interestingly, the unclassified roads probably represent 60, 70% of the total network. And what uh, you can see here is uh, what the overall condition of each of the authorities is. And the blue line that transcends each of the graph represents the size of the, the network. So it was really important that when we were comparing authorities that we did that on a, a comparative basis in terms of the size of those networks. And obviously the graph in terms of condition throw, th throws the three um, states of condition. So green is in a steady state, amber is in need of um, investigation, and red is in need of maintenance. And generally speaking, you can see that many of these authorities, certainly on the main roads, are performing pretty well. When you go down into the lower hierarchy, you can start spotting some authorities that are not performing as well as others. And that's where we get into the discussion about what are they doing differently to others and what advice may they be able to take on board to help improve that. And if we move on to the next set of graphs, uh, these are looking at other types of highway assets. So the first graph is around footway and cycleway, and the, the second one is highway structures. And the first one does look particularly erratic. And the reason for that is, is what we identified was actually many authorities don't have comprehensive inventory of footway and cycleway. So they were unable to give us information. And if they didn't have inventory, then um, part of the, the, the issue then was that they didn't have good condition data as well. And I think what's important in this context, what we're seeing particularly at this time was the push to what we call more active travel, particularly by government encouraging walking and cycling on the part of the health agenda. And you know, there is a need for authorities to uh, look at this and think about getting better information around those assets going forward, because if they want to bid for government funding, they need that data. The second graph um, is around uh, bridge condition indicators. And generally, you can see most of the authorities have good information and are performing re reasonably well in terms of their condition of their, their bridge stock. Next slide, please. The next slide then just shows a summary of all the information we got back through the maturity assessment questionnaires. So the map on the left shows the, all the authorities that contributed to this um, maturity assessment. And then the uh, spider graph shows the various scores of those authorities. And what's really interesting is where you can see there's a lot of commonality in terms of where the areas of need of improvement. If you go around the graph, you can see in areas of uh, support, planning, leadership, organization improvement all the authorities are not scoring particularly well in that context uh, and some authorities are scoring better than others in other attributes so again that provides the opportunity to share good practice across uh, these, these authorities and then if you move on to the next slide um, we also asked authorities about what their challenges were going forward um, and here's a horrendous slide of a pothole and these are the sort of uh, conditions that we've been facing on the local roads in the UK and having to deal with repairing those on a regular basis. 
So what are the key challenges? And I guess this will be familiar for the, those of you who are from municipalities. You know, having clear political support and direction is really critical to um, get support for the investment and the long-term uh, asset management principles. Um, customer expectations are rising, therefore good customer interaction, good processes are critical in this context. And what we're seeing, as I mentioned earlier, the increasing impact of climate change in terms of severe weather events and how that's uh, uh, affecting the network. But also in, in England, we're seeing a number of authorities now that are declaring climate emergencies. So what's really uh, becoming increasingly important is around reducing carbon and trying to look at a net zero approach in terms of uh, maintenance and building that into the asset management planning process. Obviously, funding is absolutely essential. Uh, having long-term funding is essential for good asset management. And uh, what I identified earlier was that, you know, there wasn't enough funding in the first place, which then created some of the challenges. And resources around some of the issues uh, that we looked at in terms of capability and capacity, making author sure authorities have got the right skills to do undertake good, effective asset management. Next slide, please. As a follow-up, we offer to all of these authorities what we call a gap analysis. So having undertaken the uh, maturity assessment, we could do more detailed uh, scrutiny around the information we had, and we use this uh, a gap analysis process. And again, we kept that relatively simple with this color-coded system. So around the 29 questions that we asked, uh, we compared the individual scores with the average and from that we identified which uh, areas needed action so we use green to say no action required amber to say there was scope for improvement and red to signify action and we were able to give detailed information from what we gleaned from other authorities that we could use to help those authorities that scored low in this context and we picked up lots of good nuggets of good practice in talking to these authorities which gave us um, some ideas about how we might continue that engagement going forward so on the next slide you can see how we brought that all together in a smart action plan for those authorities that were interested in doing the more detailed follow-up analysis and we provided comprehensive advice in terms of how they could improve their approach to asset management across all those questions in terms of what actions required prioritization uh, time scales and what the expected outcome may be of taking on board those recommendations next slide please and then thinking about all the good um, information and good practice we um, we collected from this process, uh, we, we thought about setting up a, a local authority good asset management practice group. And actually, we set this up and it's up and running now. The first meeting was in November. And what we were basically doing is uh, feeding back to those authorities that perform well to the others that perform less well. And that the authorities were very keen to be able to do that, but also to pick up on very specific areas of good practice, whether that be around managing drainage assets or those authorities that were performing well on a particular hierarchy of their road network. Next slide, please. So what were the benefits of us doing this work? We identified lots of issues, but more generally, these are more of the, some of the specific things. And what we found was uh, a lot of the asset management documents were in need of a revision, um, the corporate strategies at a political level had changed with changing agendas around climate change, looking at climate emergencies, the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic implications, the government's push to more sustainable transport. So uh, we identified that their current documents were out of date and needed realigning. We also identified uh, there was a scope for improving their asset data systems in the way that I mentioned earlier around better integration, uh, using uh, new approaches and innovation to collecting and managing data, uh, and also recognizing the importance of having the documentation and the information of an order that was uh, able those authorities to effectively bid for funding, having the evidence base to show government about the need for investment but also looking at some particular aspects around some of the uh, inventory information around key assets and the lack of inventory data around key assets of footways and cycleways was a particular issue that we identified. And this provided the catalyst, um, as I said, to provide a forum to share good practice uh, on those seven maturity at attributes. And we've now created this ongoing good practice network group 
and these, that group will be meeting now on a regular basis and we've had some really good feedback following that first meeting. So I hope you found that useful and informative, a um, lot of information there, but um, thank you very much and over to you, Chris. Thanks, Matthew. Great presentation. Uh, a couple of t key takeaways for me, and, uh, and this is not just on the work that Matthew's presented here, um, but certainly um, I suppose a, key, a set of key takeaways from maturity assessments we've done across the globe. I think the big thing for me is always that assessments are often considered necessary when a particular event has caused management to, to take a look at what's happening and try and understand why it's happening. Um, Sometimes that's down to poor performance. Sometimes it's budget constraints. And as we've seen here in the United States, it's been down to uh, the federal government setting out mandatory requirements for asset management. So there's a generally a drive for um, assessing the organization. And I would just encourage those that haven't maybe gone through an assessment at all, or maybe not one recently, um, maybe you start to think about undertaking that assessment, either bring somebody in, to support you or even do a self-assessment with, with one of the tools from the Institute of Asset Management, um, just to take a view of your organization and try and figure whether there's ways of improving how you are um, managing your assets, for example, um, and also to better prepare your organizations for um, future events, hopefully not another pandemic, but you know, the, those things are always on the horizon. Um, second thing I would say, again, Matthew talked about the assessment providing a diagnostic of the organization. It does. Um, lessons learned for me is it really, there is no one size fits all. So a solution for one organization, one agency is going to be very different than others. You can definitely learn from each other. And Matthew's got as it demonstrated that um, in the you know, good practice networking group, but there is not a one-size-fits-all approach to this. Um, you really need to think about what, what it takes to be successful, and I think the big things for me there are around vision, leadership, having that management framework in place, having access to data and information, but importantly, having a mindset to monitor, review, and continually improve your asset management. That sits at the heart of ISO 55,000 and in fact, all management system standards. Um, my last takeaway here is not just related to this webinar, but also the other webinars that we've carried out in this series is about the benefits of asset management. They're very broad. Um, we like to focus on the cost savings. That's always a big thing, but there are other benefits associated to improving asset management practices, including productivity, which obviously can impact your cost savings, but also performance, safety. We've seen huge increases in the safety and the safe operations of assets with better planning, better, um, more preventive and uh, planning and more predictive planning. Um, we've also seen increases in um, the well-being of both society at large, but also employees with the use of asset management and one of our um, webinars earlier in the week and um, talked about that. Just before we jump into questions, I'm seeing one or two coming in on the chat here. Um, I did just want to um, talk a little bit about some of the other webinars we've got. Um, I forget how many it is now. I think there must be eight, nine webinars or so that we've posted on our um, hub site wsp.com forward slash asset management. You'll see the link there. And these webinars have been carrying on since around about September this year. So there's a whole series of webinars. Please um, feel free to take a look. And, you know, if you if you found them interesting, um, send us a message, let us know. If there's something that we have missed, send us a message and let us know. And if there's something that you'd like us to review in the future, again, send us a message. We'd be We'd love to hear from you and understand what you're what you would like to hear about in the future. So with that, I'll move it over to Q and A. Um, I can see a couple of questions coming in here, and we did get a couple of questions ahead of the webinar as well. So I'll um, maybe I'll start with the ones ahead of the webinar. Um, so a question here around uh, ISO 55000. The question is. Can local authorities utilize ISO 55000 when they are struggling to align with the self-assessment? Okay, 
Yeah, no, thanks, Chris. I mean, it's interesting because, um, as I explained in my presentation, uh, only one highway authority out of that 153 in England have got accredited ISO standard. So it is not the norm that local highway authorities will have this. It may be because they feel it's not cost effective. But I think um, in terms of the principles of the standard, it, and particularly around the work I've done on asset management, all those attributes are going to be appropriate for any asset owner organization. So you can apply the principles even though they may not be accredited to the standard. I think that's a good answer. And I, and I would say that from my perspective, um, as one of the contributing authors to the standard, I, I often feel with the conversations that I have with clients that they, they big this up in their heads to something that's overwhelmingly large and often unachievable. And actually, you know, most of the agencies, organizations, local authorities, transit agencies, utilities, most of the organizations we work with have a plan in place for what they're doing with their assets. It may not be um, really robust, but they at least have a, a plan in place. They know what their capital program looks like. They have a view of what maintenance they're doing. Um, if they're able to start looking a little bit further ahead and thinking about some of those objectives of the organization and start thinking about some of the risks that they may be exposed to, and then using, um, using that risk information to start setting out some of their processes, practices, and procedures to help them manage those risks. Um, you, you, you're halfway there, really. So I think that's, uh, I, I, I like to try and sort of size the, size the, the problem um, and, and make it into, turn it into sort of bite-sized chunks in that respect. Yeah, I mean, um, if I can add to that, Chris, um, yeah. I mean, there are requirements for local highway authorities to meet government um, standards in terms of good asset management. So actually, you know, a lot of them have all the, um, the documentation and principles in place. So I don't think it would be that difficult for them to um, achieve the standard if, you know, if there was a push to do that. Yeah, good point. Another question here, what is the importance of service design life of the structure in asset management? So I'm presuming we're talking about bridges or general structures in terms yeah, of design life. Same. And I think what's critical um, in, in, in carrying out design of structures is that the, the maintenance aspects are um, built into that design. So whether that's through uh, maintenance audits, also having a good BIM model as well for the future, um, it's going to be really helpful when further work and repair needs to be carried out on that structure. So, you know, you know, it it seems to me that it's integral to to the service life, design life, to make sure that the um, from the start of the design that those aspects are built into that process. Mm. Um, I got a couple of other questions here which are related. So. Um, I'll, I'll ask I'll ask the two of them and then you can decide whether to answer them separately or together. Um, the first is how transferable is the approach that you've taken to other local authorities or or the equivalent um, across the world? And the second is, which is sort of somewhat related to that, is could you include or would you or, or would the existing members be interested in including non UK local authorities or the equivalent in your um, good practice network group? Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, both good questions, Chris. Thanks, thanks for that. I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the approach that I've advocated is, 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 you know, directly transferable. It's very generic. Um, it's not specific to UK roads. You know, the principles around the attributes are um, uh, relevant to all highway authorities elsewhere in the world. So, um, you know, you may be looking at different ways of measuring condition data and collecting inventory, but, you know, they're, they're in the detail really, but the principles uh, would be directly transferable. I really like the idea, particularly with the highway authorities of doing this comparator type work, um, because you can then pre pre create um, a momentum where there is self-help support to uh, collaborate and help each other. Um, you know, which is, is a really good approach um, so that authorities are not struggling in isolation. Um, and in terms of um, including non-UK into the group, I mean, that, I think that's quite an interesting idea because uh, it's always good to to bring in something different um, that perhaps, you know, people aren't aware of in, in this country. And I think, you know, we're quite fortunate in WSP that we have a big global footprint. And I know from time to time where we do pick up 
good practice internationally we do try and bring that back into um into our forums but um yeah i think you know that might be something we we could try and do chris excellent and i've got one last question here um which i think is more for me than you matthew so it says uh, especially from the us perspective what is the motivation for asset owners to undertake maturity assessments knowing that they will come out with a rock bottom score um interesting question i i, I will say i will answer it in two ways mm -hmm. i think first of all um i wouldn't necessarily assume that all us um organizations would come out with a rock bottom score i've seen some very good practices over here um it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all going to be aligned to ISO 55,000 or compliant with the standard, but certainly given some of the driving forces in the United States right now, um, we've seen organizations generally not um, being scored completely rock bottom and um, having at least having some, some having a score that reflects where they are on a journey to, um, to, to asset management good practice. I think the, the, the intent of the question around what, what, what is the, the purpose uh, of doing an assessment, for me, it's not just about having a score. I mean, that's, it's a nice to have, it shows you where you are now. Um, for me, it's really about un taking a look in the mirror, understanding the state of the organization, and importantly, putting in place that plan for improvement. So the, the real motivation is not just about trying to score and score high, but is it, the motivation really is about putting that plan in place for improvement and then having a clear set of objectives to move forwards on um, and, and working on that over a period of time. So everything that you do is then consistently aligned to achieving a goal of um, good practice asset management. I don't know whether you have any advice from the UK to yeah, thanks, thanks, Chris. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's all about the customer, and I think you know, it's um, you know, we have the onus to make sure that we can make best use of the resources we have, even if they're constrained to pr provide the best outcome for the customer at the end of the day, and therefore we have an imperative to really um, try and look at where we can improve, even though that you know that may be a challenge. And I think what we were quite careful of in this process, as I mentioned, you know, it would not be fair, you know, thinking of that range of size of authorities. I mean, Hartlepool will really struggle in terms of um, the scaling in this, the resources they have, but there is still scope, you know, within the, the group that we have to do some comparison work for them and help them improve. And it's not all about achieving the top score, it's just improving from where they are today. Great, Thanks, thank you. Okay, we're a few minutes over, so we'll call the uh, webinar to a closer. Thank you everyone for listening in today. Um, as I said, these are all recorded, so you can access them on our website. I wish everybody all the best for the season and health and well-being for uh, 2021. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.